it's Spurgeon. <laughs> One thing I know about <laughs> for all you meat eaters. One thing I know about tenderizing is that, you know, although there are, you know, you can tenderize by putting, I guess, salt on it or something, but normally, one thing I know about tenderizing is that you put it through a meat grinder, <laughs> or okay, a meat slicer. It kind of like has teeth on both sides, and just imagine something going through the middle, and it goes, and it just cuts through all that tough sinews and kind of makes it like mush. <laughs> And there's just enough filament in it left to that when you cook it, it kind of pulls itself back together. But when you tenderize meat, it's pretty chopped up, you know. And that reason that we give for tenderizing meat is to make it easier to chew. So think about that, you know, is that you can see people who have been tenderized because life has pretty much chewed them up, you know. And somehow they come through it without being bitter. But when they've become better for it, it's because they become tender towards others in extending the same consideration that what got them through it, they give to others. And sometimes that might be through love, it might have been through a kind word, it might have been through kindness, it might have been through mercy, it might have been through forgiveness, it might have been through conviction or some other realization that there but for the grace of God go I. So whatever it is that creates in you to become tender don't despise it because God may have sent it because you may have become angry and your message that you're communicating to people is one of anger or one of wrath or one of malice or one of you know righteousness that no one could measure up to or one of convictions of your own that are not from God so if you've got some kind of message you're communicating from an emotional base that hasn't been tenderized yet then it's probably going to come off pretty hard, pretty pretty cutthroat, pretty go for the gut, you know, and go through the, for the, the jugular, you know, and it's going to be kind of like, you know, a hit, you know, a quick hit rather than a long-term, compassionate, involved ministry to the person that causes them to come to a realization on their own of a personal relationship with God. So there's always a variety of ways that God uses, but in the ultimate end, he wants you to become more like his son than to become like his prophets or his <laughs> uh, those that would choose to not reveal the reality that God is love. Because it's easy to make God into hellfire and brimstone. And it's true, there is a hell and there is hellfire and there is a brimstone place that is the lake of fire. But what God has done by sending His Son is caused us to no longer look at the realization that He came to condemn the world, but rather He came to convince the world that God is love and that revealing that God is love will cause men to come to repentance. And so, in Spurgeon today, think about yourself and think about me and you and what God would say for us to do. The mercy of God. Meditate a little on this mercy of the Lord. It is tender mercy. With gentle, loving touch, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He is as gracious in the manner of his mercy as in the matter of it. It is great mercy, tender mercy, compassionate mercy. There is nothing little in God. His mercy is like himself. It is infinite. It extends and means more than the word could ever contain by simply defining it. It goes beyond our understanding. You cannot measure it. His mercy is so great that it forgives great sins to great sinners after great lengths of time and then gives great favors and great privileges and raises us up to great enjoyments in the great heaven of the great God. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> I think Spurgeon was playing with that one. It is undeserved mercy, as indeed all true mercy must be. For deserved mercy is only a misnomer for justice. You get what you deserve, and we call that justice. But when you don't get what you deserve, we call that mercy. 
There was no right on the sinner's part to the kind consideration of the Most High. Had the rebel been doomed at once to eternal fire, he would have richly merited that doom. And if delivered from wrath, sovereign love would alone have cause and found a just cause, for there was none in the sinner himself. So it is rich in mercy and rich mercy. Some things are great, but have little efficacy or ability in them. But this mercy is a cordial or a elixir or a remedy to your drooping spirits, a golden ointment to your bleeding wounds, a heavenly bandage to your broken bones, a royal chariot for your weary feet, a bosom of love for your trembling heart. It is manifold mercy. It is multiplied greatly and is always extended outward to those in mercy. As Bunyan says, all the flowers in God's garden are double. There is no single mercy. You may think you have but one mercy, but you shall find it to be a whole cluster of mercies extended unto you in all that you do and say. It is abounding mercy. Millions have received it, yet far from its being exhausted, it is as fresh, as full, and as free as ever. It is unfailing mercy. It will never leave you. If mercy be your friend, mercy will be with you in temptation to keep you from falling and from sinking beneath the waves, with you living to be the light and the life of your countenance, and with you in dying to be the joy of your soul when earthly comfort is ebbing fast. And if it so be that the tender mercy of God is extended towards you, ought we not likewise to be as tender in our mercy towards others as he has been merciful to us? So too, this was what old, olden days taught men to become, and Christianity was directing us as gentlemen to become in our servitude to God to be able to incorporate we used to be called the virtues that men and women ought to have from God. And that virtue, one of them, that God wants in you to be full encompassing in your direction towards others is not just mercy, but the tender mercy of God that extends itself to every single human being that God so loved the world for. Because if he died, and he said in his tender mercies from hanging on a cross, God forgive them for they know not what they do. Have we any less reason to be so put into the meat grinder of God by those words themselves and find ourselves tenderized by it and challenged to become the same, to forgive others for they don't know what they're doing and extend to them the tender mercies they need to find themselves likewise in the love of God? demonstrating his tender mercies as we live today as we exist today simply by his mercy for us and his love